that's really great in what you understand by sexual health. And on this slide, it's just showing lots of different terms that can crop up. So yes, when we talk about sexual health, we can mean so many different things. Um, it's not just confined to one particular area. So that's really important that we think, well, sexual health may be different to people, maybe because of their ages or their abilities or their cultures and religions. So different things are important um, to, to, to various people. Okay, so on this next one now, this is even looking at the notion of sexuality. Look how sometimes when people talk about sexuality, automatically someone may think, oh, that means LGBT+, lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender. But it's important for us to remember that all heterosexual people and heterosexuals form the biggest part in the world, heterosexuals have got a sexuality too. That's what their heterosexuality is. So it's not a case of them and us, you know, heterosexuals as opposed to all others, but sexuality is important for each and every one of us. And however we um, um, define our sexuality, that's uh, relevant to each and every person. So what I'm saying on this slide is that when you consider that term sexuality, think about it from at least these four perspectives. So on the one hand, you you have the person's orientation. So somebody might say, well, I'm straight, I'm heterosexual. Somebody else might say, I'm lesbian. Somebody else might say, I don't know yet. I'm not too sure. So they might be described as questioning with a question mark. Okay? So a person's orientation, and literally, if you check out the origins of that word, check out the etymology, where does the word come from, orientation literally means the way you're facing. And that's what it means, the way you're facing in life. So your sexual orientation is, that's the way you are. That's who you are. But when it comes to a person's identity or their label, so they might label themselves, they might say, oh, I'm gay, or I'm lesbian, I'm straight. They might use those labels, but they may not. Supposing they're living in a country or a culture where it's illegal to be anything other than heterosexual. So you have children growing up, and as they're growing up, you might get someone realizing, I don't feel the same as everyone else in my family. I don't feel the same as everyone else in my school. They know there's a difference. But if nobody's talking about sexualities, they may not know the words of what they want to explore or to talk about. They may not know of the labels. Or if they live in a country where their lives may be at risk, if they come out as anything other than heterosexual, they might have to say, well, my orientation, I know I'm attracted to people of the same sex as me, but I dare not speak about that to anyone else. So in some cultures, you even see people um, where you get men and women who get married because that's the traditional, the expected thing to do. So they may be doing it because their culture is expecting that of them. So therefore, the label seems to be that these are heterosexuals. These are straight people. But their attractions, where are their eyes looking? When they're out in the street and they're passing people, who are they looking at? Their attractions may not be the same as the identity label that they're using. And then importantly, their behaviours may be different as well. So it could be, supposing in a country where men and women have to get married, you, you have to get married together, and you cannot come out as any other di different orientation, they may be married to someone of the opposite sex, but how do you know they're not having sex with people of their own gender? And if they are, and if it's in a country or a culture or a religion where this is a taboo and nobody can talk about it, it may mean that they can't tell anyone. So on one of the earlier screens, when you were typing in words for sexual health, some of you said safety, safer sex. But how can you practice safer sex? How can you go and get condoms, for example, if in your country or your culture that's not allowed? Or if a person then says, well, I need condoms because I'm having sex with someone of the same gender as me, if that's not allowed, or if it's frowned upon, or if it's silenced, if it's taboo, then 
their safety is under threat here. So really important that when you think of that word sexuality, don't just think of the label. Because the label may be different to their orientation and it may be different to how they're attracted to other people and it may also be different to their behaviours. Okay, so with that term sexuality, really important to think of that. But also it's important to think about it across the life course as well. Just because you might say, oh, my patients are all old. I'm working on a um, care of elderly people ward. And therefore you don't think sexuality is relevant. Of course it's still relevant to each and every one of them. If you talk to them about sexuality, they might say, well, I feel a bit too old to have it now, but I'm really sorry that I'm not still having sex. Or supposing you're working with someone who has dementia and maybe their partner comes in, their husband or wife, they come in and they say, what I miss is being intimate with my spouse. That's all to do with sexuality. Or it may even be that some older people might have regrets about things that have happened or maybe not happened earlier in life. So sexuality is really important for everyone. On this next slide, it's asking you a quick question now. So when you, as, as students, when you go out into areas of clinical practice, what type of issues of sexual health have you come across in the areas of practice you've been out in? So are you talking about generic, holistic sexual health? Have you come across people with sexual infections? or unplanned or unwanted conceptions, HIV, sexuality issues, or maybe it's to do with counselling, mental health, psychosexual. Or you might have come across people who have been abused, violated or raped, or then any other issues. So from what you've experienced in practice so far, what are the type of things you have experienced? That's really great how these results are coming in. But look at the one column, the one on sexual abuse, violence and non-consenting sex. Look how that one is higher than any of the others. Yeah, so that could be a really important issue, especially for you to say to your educators, look, we come across this in practice, but we need to know more about it. We need to know how to deal appropriately with it. OK, I'll move on from this slide, but I'll keep this Mentimeter running for the next day or so. Well, for, say for today. So if you want to vote later, go back in later. I'll set it over to the function so that you can access it at your own pace. OK, and then I'll feed back the results to you all, hopefully by tomorrow. Now, let me ask you this one really quickly. So, supposing you are dealing with people in practice, and maybe it's about sexual abuse that you've just said, or sexuality issues, or whatever it is you're talking about, how easy or difficult do you personally find that? So, if you have to sit down and talk to somebody about it, how easy would it be? Looking at these results coming in, especially from this position of um, entrepreneurship for each one of you, look at the ones who are saying here that you find it difficult or you feel out of your depth or out of your comfort zone. So in that case, really important that you say to your educators, we definitely need to do stuff about this because you will be working with people around sexual health issues right across your careers. So if you're finding it difficult now, then it's best to do something about it as soon as you can. OK, so win your educators over to be able to, 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 to help you deal with this more. But not just the educators at your universities, even when you go into practice, maybe the, the person you're allocated to as a mentor, consider talking to them about it, especially if you see some of these issues cropping up and nobody's talking about it maybe they just sweep things under the carpet, then you should be able to ask your mentors, look, this is what I've noticed, but is that the best thing for us to do for our clients? Could we deal with this differently? So you're exploring ways, especially if you find it hard. And I've got a model I want to show you at the end of this, which hopefully will make it much easier for you. OK, thank you for answering those. And there's another one quick one here. This one is just mentioning different sexual topics that you may come across in practice. So, would you find it difficult to talk about some of these things or easy? 
have a look at those. So contraception or reproductive health or anything about sexualities, any particular sexual practices and masturbation is one that may be mentioned. Or some of you have said that you've seen quite a lot then around the non-consexual se uh, sex and abuse. Do you find it difficult to talk about these things or is it easy? And what about with myths? Because so often people have been told things. Maybe it's been passed down through their families or their cultures, especially using a word erotophobia. And erotophobia means fear of sex. But I would say that in healthcare practice, our erotophobia is in talking about it. So if sexual things happen, or if people want to talk about sexual practices, we may find it a bit too difficult. So even we can be affected by erotophobia. So it's challenging those myths. Um, otherwise, people don't learn the correct things. And sexual pleasure. If you go onto a website for the World Association for Sexual Health, you'll notice they've even got an international declaration on everyone has a right to sexual pleasure. And yet we know throughout the world this is denied to so many people. Okay. Um, earlier this week we had... Um, uh, International Women's Day and women in particular look how in many parts of the world sexual pleasure is the last thing that they can talk about so very important so have a look at the World Association for Sexual Health website and look at their sexual pleasure declaration and the final one there when it talks about dealing with erotophobia in ourselves or others yes sometimes you might think oh no i can't talk about that it's too embarrassing or i'm too shy i'm not too sure what to do so how do we deal with that in ourselves rather than just run away from it and ignore it okay and i think this is the final question i'm asking you now before i go back to the presentation so are there any particular issues that you would really need help with in how to deal with these anything you find very difficult to discuss and maybe why any topics you find really difficult to discuss and why would you find that difficult Oh, that's fantastic. None. Great. Loss. Mm -hmm. Well, this is really encouraging seeing so many of you saying none, which, which I suppose you mean that there's nothing that you would find difficult to talk about. That's fantastic. Because when you think about it, our sexual health, our sexualities, um, our rights to sexual pleasure, these are all part of being human. And you may be really good at talking about somebody's broken arm and how they need a plaster Paris on it, or you may be able to deal with someone who's feeling quite depressed. So usually the body and the psyche are well cared for in healthcare services. So in that case, the fact that you're able to talk about this would be great. Now, some of the stuff coming up, yeah, and when you're talking about um, abortion, for example, um, and abuse, there are lots of things, and religion and culture, there are lots of things that many people do find a taboo. Maybe because it's illegal in their countries, or because traditionally people don't talk about these things. Even here in the UK, for example, abortion is what's called legally permitted. So that's not legal. You, a woman can't just go along and say, I want an abortion. It's still illegal, but under certain circumstances, the law allows it. So that's what's meant by legally permissible. So by the time a woman reaches the age of 40 in the UK, about one in three will have had at least one abortion and yet very few people ever talk about it so even though it's legally permitted there's still a lot of stigma and taboo especially in talking about it this is fantastic what you're saying here so i'll get back to you i'll respond to what you're saying okay right and some of those things especially when you're talking about um, uh, sexual abuse rape abortion, some of the things that you're talking about in relation to taboo, there was a famous French philosopher, Michel Foucault, and he called something a triple edict. 
And by that he referred to something that's taboo, non-existent or silent. So when you're thinking about so many of these particular issues, and one of you wrote then about childhood abuse. So yes, yeah, supposing you're living in a part of the world where it does happen, but nobody's allowed to talk about it. So the very fact that people are being silent is because this issue is considered to be a taboo. And in that case, it looks as if it doesn't even exist. You won't find statistics on some of these things because nobody's talking about it. So it's really important. And the reason why I've got an image of a cabinet here is because a friend of mine, uh, a nurse, she did her PhD and she was looking at the psychological impact of abortion on women. And when I read her thesis, the one thing that really struck me was that one of the women respondents said that she refers to her abortion as being her bottom drawer stuff. So if you think of a, a, a chest of drawers that you've got clothes in, she said the top drawer is what you open up and you show to the world. That's you, that's what you want everyone to see. The middle drawer is a little bit more private and that's what you'd keep just for your family and loved ones. She said, but the bottom drawer, that's where I keep my abortion and I don't tell anyone about it. Okay, so you've all been talking on that previous slide, you've been talking about some things that certain people would find difficult in talking about. So as nurses and midwives, you've got such a unique opportunity to be with people and to let them talk, let them express themselves and give voice to, to many of these issues. So really important there. And one of the ways in which we can approach it, approach this is th through these three panels. And I'm calling it a triptych model. This is something that came out of my own doctorate a few years ago. It's looking at sexual health from three different perspectives. Now, the one perspective is what we normally think of as sexual health. So if you tell your friends and colleagues, oh, I did a session on sexual health, what's the bet they'll tell you? Oh, that means sexual infections, um, reproduction and contraception, abortion, HIV or psychosexual. That's the usual thing. But if you look under the umbrella, look, midwifery, that's so important. Almost every single person who's pregnant is pregnant because of sex. So unless it's been through in vitro fertilization or something, they've had sex. So therefore you need to be able to talk about sex. And one of the problems for midwifery practice, for example, is when do you talk about contraception for after the baby's born? Because look how many midwives may think, well, I won't talk about it in antenatal services. That's too early. And then the postnatal midwife might think, well, I won't talk about it now because she's all excited with her new baby. Now is not the right time. And when, she, when the woman goes home, and maybe she's got health visitors coming in to see her, and the health visitors might think, well, I won't talk about it because the midwife did. Or they might think, well, I won't talk about it because the general practitioner will talk about it. And by the time the general practitioner gets to talk about it, the woman might even be pregnant again. And maybe she did not want to be pregnant so soon after just giving birth. Or it may be a case that some women might say to you, um, look, when is it safe for me to start having sex again? Or somebody may express real concerns. They might say, look, it hurt me when I had my baby, so I don't feel ready for sex yet. It's certainly not pleasurable, but I'm frightened if I don't have sex with my, my, my husband, maybe he'll want to have sex with somebody else. Now, that's a psychosexual worry or concern. So all of these things really important about how to address sexual health. The other panel is when we talk about holistic care. So look, for a, look at us as um, nurses. We say our philosophy of care is we want to approach people holistically. On this model here, right at the top, I'm showing the body and the mind, um, um, the soma, the somatic, and the psychic. But also, we're more than just that. Think about people's spirituality or their life beliefs. They may call it their personal philosophy. It may be, look, this is something more about me than just my body and my mind. And the final three words here are three Greek words which mean love, sex and relationships. 
So when we're dealing with our clients holistically, if we say, oh yes, I'm a nurse, so I care for clients holistically. But if you're not addressing their sexual health and well-being, I would maintain you're not caring for them holistically. So it's really important there. And the third panel on that triptych, that looks at the impact on sexual health, which is secondary to other conditions. So, say for example, um, say type 1 diabetes. For men who have type 1 diabetes, one in every two men will have problems with erections. So you may be working in general practice and may be working with a diabetes nurse specialist. And the diabetes nurse specialist is fantastic at talking about blood glucose levels, um, uh, how to monitor their health, what to eat, what about exercise. They may be fantastic about that. But if that nurse doesn't say, look, one in two men with diabetes will have problems with erections. How is your diabetes affecting you that way? If they don't address it, they've swept it under the carpet. It's taboo, not talked about. The other things, look at mental, mental health problems. It could be certain psychiatric drugs take away a person's libido, their desire for sex. Or it could be that certain psychiatric drugs have a negative effect on certain uh, oral methods of contraception. So whatever the person's condition, or people with uh, different physical disabilities or learning disabilities. With learning disabilities, look how many societies say, oh, they've got learning disabilities, don't talk to them about sex, otherwise they'll want to run out and do it. So that's not acknowledging that the person has a right to their own sexual health and well-being, including a right to pleasure. So there's so many illnesses, or maybe it's some sort of illness that brings disfigurement to a person. Maybe a person's had an amputation, and now they oh, especially, say for example with women, if a woman has had breast cancer, and if she has to have a breast removed, look how she may say, I don't feel very womanly anymore. I don't feel like a real woman. Now that's psychological, that's psychosexual. So that's really, really important because then she might turn around and think, well, I don't think anyone will find me attractive. Or I don't think my, my, my partner finds me attractive anymore. These are real psychological impacts on their sexual health and well-being. So very important there, looking at those three particular models. And this slide here is just telling you some of the wonderful positive things about sex. So whenever we're talking about sexual health, yeah, let's think about health. Let's think about the positive things that sex can do in people's lives. And I'll make sure this slide is on your presentation for you so you can check it later.